Spirit Airlines, the no-frills carrier known for its bright yellow planes, brash style, and low fares has helped revolutionize the way we pay for travel. To offset its bare-bones fares, the carrier charges for everything from carry-on bags to bottles of water. With Spirit Airlines, your ticket price includes basically your seat, your seatbelt, and the air you breathe. Everything else is extra. What we deliver is a very low fare, high quality service um, with one of the best on-time performance records in the country, the lowest mishandled bag rate in the country. Uh, and when you deliver low fares and you allow people to pick and choose those things that they like, that's how they, they deliver an even lower fare for themselves. And we think that's what, what we do every day. As of 2019, Spirit Airlines had 13 consecutive years of profitability. But the airline that travelers love to hate has fallen on tough times. With the coronavirus pandemic causing passenger traffic to plummet, Spirit announced third quarter 2020 total operating revenue of $402 million, a 60% drop from a year earlier. The industry is in a tougher spot than it's been in the 35 years that I've been in the industry for sure. To keep passengers safe and on board, Spirit requires face coverings for its passengers and crew, uses foggers to disinfect the aircraft, and has waived some change fees. But is it enough? And will Spirit Airlines be able to bounce back from the economic fallout battering the airline industry? Spirit Airlines got its start in the early 1980s in Detroit, Michigan, under the name Charter One. Originally a trucking company, it became known for flying gambling junkets to Atlantic City. In 1992, the airline added scheduled passenger service, renamed itself Spirit Airlines, and a few years later relocated its headquarters to Southern Florida. But it was a new management team that helped transform the airline and the industry. In the mid-2000s, private equity firms Oak Tree Capital Management and Indigo acquired a stake in the business. The new team closed unprofitable routes, shifted the carrier's focus to the Caribbean and Latin America, and transitioned the airline to a low-cost carrier. It also promoted Ben Baldanza in 2006 to CEO. When I joined Spirit in 2005, it was a company that was losing about $80 million a year and really was not focused on what it was doing. It was trying to be sort of a two-class airline with a business class product and coach, but didn't have very high frequency, had very old airplanes. In 2007, Spirit cut costs further by unbundling its services, introducing baggage fees, and charging for food and beverages on board. It ditched in-flight magazines, sold advertising on tray tables, overhead bins, and on flight attendants' aprons. The ultra-low-cost carrier was born. What we recognized was that as a small airline, we couldn't really compete against the bigger, more well-known airlines in the world playing their same game. So we looked over in Europe and saw what Ryanair was doing, and we looked back in time and saw what Southwest was in the 1980s and said, maybe we can become that. And what we, the epiphany that we had was let's compete for traffic on the basis of price not necessarily on the basis of having a nicer product or a more comfortable experience or things like that. The airline also launched its $9 Fare Club, an annual subscription program similar to Sam's Club or Costco that allowed members access to even cheaper fares and discounted baggage fees. By 2010, Spirit had a base fare 40% lower than its mid-2000 levels. On May 26, 2011, Spirit Airlines debuted on the NASDAQ at $12 a share. In the early 2010s, the carrier was adding flights to Dallas, Chicago, and Las Vegas, as well as cities in Central America and South America. It was also offering deep discounts, including $9 flights from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. To keep expenses low and raise brand awareness, the airline relied on sometimes off-color viral advertisements. To promote a flight to Toronto, the airline said, we're not smoking crack, our fares really are this low, in reference to Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's drug problems. So we came up with this idea that if we ran ads that were hopefully funny, maybe a little controversial, made fun of sort of popular topics, that maybe people would share them with friends or um, and would go viral in a sense, and that really worked. It's the type of advertising that, frankly, you would expect from some high school boys uh, uh, and lots of double entendres uh, and, and things like that. But it helped the advertising go viral. 
In 2011, Spirit spent just $2.5 million on marketing, 37% less than 2010. But cost-cutting measures were starting to result in complaints about flight delays and cancellations, problems with baggage, and issues with reservations and bookings. According to a 2014 study by the U.S. Public Interest Research Group Education Fund, Spirit Airlines was the most hated airline in America. The research found that between 2009 and 2013, Spirit Airlines generated nearly three times the number of complaints as the second highest airline. We had what we called two types of complaints at the time. We had complaints of failure of delivery. So we were late or we spilled coffee on you or we were rude or something like that. Those were complaints we wanted to eliminate. Then we had another group of complaints that were expectation related. People who were upset that we didn't give them a free glass of water on board, that we made them buy a bottle of water, or upset that they had to pay for a bag to check that they didn't, and they didn't realize that. Maybe they bought their ticket on Expedia and it wasn't as clear there as it was on spirit.com. That's where we had to get better and better about explaining to customers about just what it means to buy Spirit Airlines. According to the U.S. Public Interest Research Group Education Fund, in the years leading up to 2008, the Department of Transportation issued Spirit Airlines five different fines, totaling over half a million dollars for violating various consumer protection laws and multiple cases of deceptive advertising. Our fares were lower in total than any other airline. We were pretty clean. We didn't lose a lot of bags, but our flights weren't that on time. And we struggled with that a bit, and the company has now fixed that in a sense, and they've been able to become more and more on time, and that's made the model even stronger, I think. In 2014, Spirit launched its Bear Fair campaign to educate consumers about its pricing structure and to reassure customers that it wasn't trying to nickel and dime them. Some of the other airlines out there would like you to think that they are flying palaces. The truth is that the passenger experience between coach on a network airline, such as American Delta and United, and Spirit isn't all that different. By December 2014, shares had risen to a peak closing price of $84. Then in 2016, Spirit appointed board member Robert Fernero as the new president and CEO. Ted Christie took over the role in 2019. In 2019, Spirit Airlines had operating revenue of $3.8 billion, 390% higher than 2010. By the end of 2019, Spirit had more than 600 daily flights to 77 destinations in 16 countries throughout the U.S., Latin America, and the Caribbean. While legacy carriers like Delta, American, and United make a big chunk of their revenue catering to high-paying business travelers, ultra-low-cost airlines like Spirit target budget flyers by keeping fares low and charging passengers for services. In 2019, Spirit Airlines had operating revenue of $3.8 billion, 49% of that money came from the purchase of tickets, and the rest came from air travel-related services like check bags, seat upgrades, change fees, and loyalty programs. Non-fare passenger revenue at Spirit Airlines was $1.8 billion in 2019, including baggage fees, which accounted for 39% of revenue. Passenger usage fees, like when you book online or over the phone, made up 36% of revenue, and seat booking, which made up 12% of revenue. The company also makes money from the sale of frequent flyer miles to the company's credit card partners. Since 2006, Spear has made a lot of money charging passengers for everything from bottled water to printing out your boarding pass for you. Non-ticket revenue surged from $5 per passenger in 2006 to $56 in 2019. But what we do now is we're much more optimized in how we price the products to the consumer. So the guests on board, when they pick whether or not they want a check bag or a carry-on bag or a seat assignment, we're trying to align the price of that product with the demand in the season. And we think that gives us the best value to our guests. It also gives our shareholders a good return. Still have to pay for bottled water? We still, okay. yes, we still, um, we offer that on board as an option if you'd like to, uh, uh, to buy a bottle of water, that's correct. Other airlines have followed suit. That even though Spirit was a small but growing airline, they actually set trends that ended up being copied by many, many airlines. The idea of ancillary revenue, meaning charges for things other than the ticket, has become very popular around the world. And even big, high cost, high service airlines have more charges today than they used to because they saw at Spirit how successful that model was. 
In 2015, Delta Airlines started selling basic economy class seats. Two years later, American and United followed suit with their own basic economy products. That has become sort of the model for the rest of the industry. Uh, so what happens is you get these really eye-catching fares, and it's like New York to Florida for you know under 50 bucks, or even like far less than that in some cases. But then you have to add in everything else, like how many bags are you bringing, where are you sitting on the plane. And it's not just additional fees that give Spirit's bottom line a boost. Cramming people on planes helps lift revenue at the airline too. According to Seat Guru, one configuration of Spirit's A320 can hold 182 passengers. Those planes are packed to the gills with seats. Uh, leg, standard coach legroom on Spirit is around 28 or 29 inches, uh, as opposed to on uh, Southwest Alaska American United Delta, where it's 30 inches or more, and JetBlue is 32, 33 inches or more. They have also added something in the front of the plane called the big front seat, where you pay a little bit more and you have, you know, like a, a more luxurious seat compared with the rest. But that lack of legroom um, or like having a small amount of legroom helps them or has helped them even before coronavirus put as many people on board as possible. And that's the model. It's carry as many people as you can, pretty dense cabin, and then that's how you make your money. Business travel is the backbone of the U.S. airline industry. Prior to COVID-19, business travel accounted for about half of U.S. carriers' revenue and only about a third of trips, according to Airlines for America. 85% of respondents said they have canceled most or all of their business trips for 2020, according to a September study by the Global Business Travel Association. Right now, fewer than 10% of people flying are business travelers. It's almost 90% or more leisure. Analysts say Spirit, with its existing clientele of leisure travelers, could have an easier time than large U.S. carriers Delta, United, and American moving back to profitability. There are certain advantages that I think low-cost carriers have. Number one, they are serving leisure and family kind of travel. And most people, I think, believe, I certainly believe, that that's the travel that's going to come back sooner than business travel. Some business travel is going to convert forever to the way you and I are talking right now, right through video. In the summer of 2020, American added flights to mountain destinations in Montana, Colorado, and Wyoming. United announced in August 2020 it was adding 28 daily nonstop flights to four popular Florida destinations. Those extra passengers could help alleviate some of the short-term pain, but according to analysts, legacy carriers still need high-paying business travelers to return to profitability. Those airlines aren't structured to be profitable carrying that traffic as the core of what they do. Those airlines need business travel. They need the higher fares of business travel to justify their complex fleet, lounges in the airport, relatively spacious airplanes with multiple cabins. All of those things are meant to attract a higher fare paying customer. So if long term their business is to say we're going to pivot and be a leisure carrier, they're going to have to change a lot about their company before they're going to be able to be successful financially at that. Another issue for legacy carriers is the makeup of their fleet. Spirit operates one type of plane, but Delta, United, and American fly a variety of planes, including wide-body planes. Those planes fly very long distances, but they're expensive to buy, they're expensive to fly because they use a lot of fuel, and long-haul travel is going to take longer to recover. And the amount of long-haul travel that's going to come back is very uncertain right now. As of December 2019, Spirit had a fleet of 145 Airbus single-aisle planes. Flying the A320 family allows the carrier to avoid costs like trading crews across multiple types of aircraft and buying spare parts for different types of planes. With uncertainty surrounding the economic outlook, it might be Spirit's low-cost model that resonates with consumers the most. And that could be good news for the ultra-low-cost carrier. You're not flying Spirit because you want a posh trip. You fly Spirit because you need to go from A to B and want to pay as little money as possible. 